Dr. Ed Back from the College of Engineering is going to talk about his center, the Center for Sustainable Infrastructure. And as you know, our goal here at the Lunch and Learn is to talk about the efforts of our centers, our institutes, our research efforts, our research projects, and create synergy between our partners in terms of how we could work together and support these processes. So as Ed discusses what his center is doing and what their plans are for the future, be thinking about how your work might intersect with that or any questions or concerns that you have about the subject matter. And then we'll engage in discussion with Ed after he presents. Well, good afternoon and thank you for sharing lunch with me. I'm really excited about being here because um, Many of you might not know too much about our center. We're one of the newest centers. Uh, we're really just trying to get our legs under us. And so for us, this is really great opportunity to meet with all of you because hopefully we can build some uh, bridges between what we do and what you do and the pun was intended there. But uh, we'd like to um, you know, create some collaborations and uh, do some work together so I think uh, uh, this is a great opportunity for us to tell you a little bit about what we're doing. Uh, the Center for Sustainable Infrastructure, I'm the um, director of that program. Mike Krager is our associate director. Um, he's also an endowed chair in the Department of Civil Construction and Environmental Engineering. He can't be with us because he's hosting another, other, you know, another corporation who's here looking at uh, maybe collaborating with us, their executive vice president for sustainable uh, something or other is here today. And so uh, we have a lot going on and I'm happy to share with you a little bit about what we're trying to do. We're like all centers uh, research focused. Um, we're really trying to uh, look at constructed infrastructure and we're really way beyond just the constructed infrastructure itself, we're interested in the process to get it there, how it's managed, how it performs over time. We're interested in the cost aspects of it and a lot of other uh, issues around it. But we are, we're, we're principally looking at physical or constructed infrastructure. We want to uh, approach that in a multidisciplinary collaborative way. And that's the important part. We recognize right from the beginning that this is not a center that really should be uh, home-based in one department and we sort of self-contain uh, what we do. That, that would not work for us. So we recognize that we need to extend uh, everything we do beyond our own boundaries and so we're, we're very, very uh, focused on creating collaborative uh, relationships and explore uh, linkages with others as it does exist, of course, in the actual physical environment. The reality is that uh, a lot of what we do, maybe historically in engineering, and I'll use my own disciplinary, discipline area as an example perhaps, but you know, we'll look at physical structures and we want to see how that building performs under certain conditions and so we're very focused on that building and we do things to make that building more resilient to the impacts or the forces that might might be in place. The reality is however if you expand that and say well how would the entire community perform? In fact how would this whole region perform? Um, then it's a it's a much different problem. It's a much bigger problem, of course, and it involves many, many, many disciplines. And so uh, we, we're, we're really trying to look at macro level sort of issues um, along the way. So we, we think of this as a complex sort of interdependent system where we have our own leadership and management, we hope, that has some influence on that. But there's students, of course, that um, and faculty that participate. We have uh, marvelous new laboratories that uh, the University of Alabama has uh, provided us. We'll talk about that a little bit as well. But we also have in industry partners. Um, 
and collaborators at universities, and not just, frankly, in our region, but around the United States and, and actually around the world. We've, we, we've actually already begun to build linkages um, really across the world, not just Europe. We're doing some things in Europe. We're, in fact, uh, on our way over to Norway shortly. We have a colleague that's leaving for China tomorrow morning. Uh, we're doing work all over the, the world, and we're excited about that. And so, lots of opportunities to interact. Some of those collaborators are private industry, some are public sector organizations, some are universities. Uh, one of the words that, or, or buzzwords maybe is a better way to express it, that you'll hear a lot is resiliency. Um, a lot of research is focused on resiliency, uh, but there's a lot of issues around that. One is how do you assess it? Um, be interesting to study how you assess it before it's built. Uh, it's a little different process to assess it after it's constructed. How does the assessment process really work? How do you judge or evaluate vulnerability? Even thinking about vulnerability is a complex issue. We can have vulnerability defined in a lot of different ways. And that's an ongoing area of science, actually, that's very important to us. A key aspect, what we also want to focus on, though, is should an event occur, how do you recover quickly from the event? I mean, what's that process look like? And so all of those things, I think, are part of our scope and something that we're trying to pursue. Now, this is a little bit of a complex diagram, and forgive me for that, and I'm going to just highlight a couple of things. And it, uh, this is one that actually uh, we developed as a graphic in a research proposal. Um, but it helps express some of the other things that I think uh, we're, we're, we're trying to address. A lot of communities, if you think about things at a macro scale, we, we, we talk about social vulnerability. You know, when, when a community or an area is, is vulnerable, uh, also, it, it, almost always in sort of a con as a consequence to that, there's an impact on prosperity. And prosperity is another metric or another measure that, that, that has influence. So as vulnerability is high, usually prosperity is perhaps low. And so then the question is, well, how can we influence that? And there's a lot of things that we might do to influence it. We're focused on uh, research and innovations, but ultimately what we're trying to move or do is move from an existing condition where we have high vulnerability and low prosperity ultimately to influence society where there's low vulnerability and high prosperity. I mean, that's what we'd really like to do. And that's, that's not easily accomplished, but it's something that's an ongoing sort of effort or initiative we'd like to do. So our particular center is focused on at least these objectives. And of course, all of us as research center programs revisit our strategic plans frequently, but we do want to identify and analyze demands on critical infrastructure systems and explore the factors necessary for successful de development and management of systems, infrastructure systems. We would like to influence public policy because a lot of this is, uh, is um, in that domain to really do what we want to do facilitate and improve um, all of our collaborations across all the organizational boundaries and address interoperability. We're, that's a big issue for us. We have pockets of expertise and pockets of knowledge and we have to get everybody uh, sharing information. <coughs> Research emphasis for us is deliberately and purposely broad. Uh, st <coughs> structural resiliency is certainly uh, an area of strength for us. We have some facilities right here on the campus which allow us a unique opportunity to, stru to study structural systems particularly. Uh, we have, for all of you that are in the room, you're probably aware of it, but we have um, a new shake table that we have over in the building across the way here that's uh, one of the finest shake tables in the country. In fact, we were hosting, a, as I mentioned a minute ago, we were hosting a group just today. They asked how many facilities are comparable to the one you have at the University of Alabama. We went through and identified all the ones that, that we know of. And, um, you know, we can identify about four, maybe five, that have a comparable capability to ours. 
So we're really quite fortunate. We have, we have um, an ability to do things here in terms of research and structures that um, is, is really not matched uh, in most universities. So we're happy about that. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, thinking about economics and life cycle cost analysis, I mean, ultimately, it's not just the initial cost, it's how all of that improved infrastructure impacts in the long term. So a lot of things related to life cycle costing, we've collaborated with CBER a number of times already on some research proposals. But that's the sort of thing that we'd like to really get into. How do you rehabilitate what's already there? I mean, um, it's not really practical in most cases for us to say, you know, just sort of to declare something is unfit or it's unsatisfactory, so we're just going to knock it all down, demolish all of it, and just build new. It's just, that's just not practical. So how do you retrofit or how do you rehabilitate structures that have vulnerability or infrastructure systems that have vulnerability? How do we improve resiliency? It's something we're focused on. The sociological perspectives and all the related considerations are key. I mean, ultimately, we're, we're, we're building habitat. And, and so as we think about how society operates and, and lives within that habitat, there's, there's just many impacts that we really need to evaluate, we need to study, we need to better understand. So we're focused on that. Communities need to be more sustainable. Now, the emphasis there is on community, not structure. Right? So I can build a structure. The issue is, can I, can I make a community more sustainable? Can I make a, an entire region more resilient? How do I do that? There's a lot of underdeveloped nations, um, as you well know, that, that need what we're doing. Um, I tell my class all the time how the world needs this kind of work and this kind of research. I mean, we have, the reality is there's, there's, there's societies all around the globe that are socially vulnerable. They're vulnerable. They have vulnerabilities due to inadequate infrastructure and a lot of the things that are associated with that. So how do you, how do you address that? How can we do that? What impact can we have? And we want to do that. And it's beyond just doing, uh, and, and I'm, I'm not diminishing its value, but it's beyond just you know, doing a service learning project where we take some students and they travel off somewhere and they get a great two-week experience and they do a, a project somewhere and they help somebody get a little better <laughs> drinking water. And, that, and that's great. But how can we do something that is real impactful for the long term? I mean, how can we really make a difference? And so our goals are admittedly pretty high, but the research area is very broad and, and so we are focused on trying to do that. Interoperability and information Integration is another area that's really obvious to us. As, as expertise lies in dispersed areas or fields of science or fields of engineering, you know, how do, I, how do I benefit from what he knows and he knows and she knows? How can I benefit from that instead of it just existing in pockets where it's not shared like it ought to be? Sometimes I've done some work, I've already traveled enough and I've given enough presentations and I hear sometimes people will say, well, you know, that piece of information existed but we didn't have access to it, we couldn't, we couldn't retrieve that, we, so the benefit maybe was lost or at least the benefit was diminished from what it could be. Research partnerships that we're very focused on already certainly uh, would include these. CAPS is one that's particularly important to us. There's expertise within CAPS that, in my view, I, I don't think exists anywhere else. We're very fortunate to have CAPS at the University of Alabama, and we want to partner with CAPS. I mean, they have a skill set and an ability, a research ability that's phenomenal. So that's a strength, and we want to, we want to, we want to embrace that and partner with them. And, 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 and fortunately for us, uh, so far, CAPS is, uh, has agreed to do that. And so, so we've done some things together. Uh, the Insurance Institute, or really the Alabama Center for Insurance Information and Research, you met Lars Powell, I think, um, a few weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago. Lars is a uh, close ally with us. In fact, we're doing some things collaboratively with them, which I'll again talk about in just a moment. UTCA, or our Transportation Center, uh, we're doing some work with them. 
I mean, let's think about systems for a minute, transportation systems. You say, well, my gosh, I mean, what's to know about that? We've been doing roads since the Romans, right? I mean, what can we do different? Well, here's a thought. I mean, I heard our, one of our engineers not too long ago tell us that uh, we're designing cars that can uh, think for you, or they can drive for you. They're, it's, they're intelligent. The cars are intelligent. I mean, they'll, they'll drive for you. Well, that's pretty neat. But if that's true, and then there's intelligence in that automobile, then why can't the bridge detect that it has eyes on it? Why can't it self-detect that? Which I think it can. And then if it can, through sensors and some other things, why can't it communicate that information to the car? Not when the car's on the bridge, but when the car's 20 miles before the bridge. Why can't my bridge communicate, my intelligent bridge communicate with that intelligent automobile? I mean, why can't we do that? Better yet, why can't then the bridge, sensing that it's iced, reach down in the ground and grab the thermal energy that's there and thaw itself out? I mean, why, why can't it sense and respond and communicate and do all those things? Well, we can do those, and we're all excited about that, but that means blending a lot of disciplines together to make things happen, right? So that, that doesn't happen within one department. It, it's, it's a very highly collaborative deal. In fact, we floated that idea, and a couple of insurance companies immediately wanted to, you know, lock up that idea, you know? Uh, so, it, and it's just one. But we want to do those sorts of things. So transportation. Uh, the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety is a marvelous facility. Um, it's really funded, it's not on this campus, but it's funded out of insurance really, and, and they're trying to improve entire communities so they're more resilient. Uh, really focused on, on wind engineering, uh, and, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but we're doing some work with them. CBER, we talked about, CBER has already participated in multiple proposals with us. Um, Acre, our, our real estate group here on campus, is, is one that we are already working with. And uh, we're trying to, um, to really um, link stronger with the National Water Center that's here because that's also an influence on our nation's infrastructure. So just, just, in, just already, and I admit that we're kind of in our infancy, but, but already we've got some exciting things happening and we're thrilled about that. So thrust areas. You know, we're, we're looking at large macro-scale problems, not just individual buildings necessarily, but we're looking at societal issues, the built environment, how we uh, prepare for and recover from hazards, and those hazards are broad. Those can be, those can be everything from, from sort of the obvious to something less, less obvious. Data and data management and all those other issues. So we're, we're, we're trying to uh, address those. Now I've got some graphics that the print's probably going to be too fine for you to read, and that's okay because uh, who wants to read all that anyway? But the point here is, it is it's intended, the graphics one we use, to try and show the interdisciplinary nature of what we're trying to do. So, you know, in this particular case, we have cost, of course, and CBER helps us with that, but what's the cost impacts, what's the cost savings, what's the, the cost consequence of a lot of the alternatives that we're proposing? How is it financed? What's the benefit? I mean, it, it's actually pretty complex modeling. We want to better understand how the built environment performs, right? How, how it performs. Maybe we, we had a little project with the state and somebody said, just to keep it simple, y'all bored yet? You doing okay? Everybody smile at me. You doing okay? Oh. Huh? This is <laughs> somebody, we'll just keep keeping it real simple, right? Somebody said, gee, shouldn't we just pave roads in asphalt or should we pave them in concrete? I mean, that's a simple question. We ought to be able to answer that, right? Well, one has a lower initial cost, but maybe one has a better life cycle cost. So then the question is, so how do you, how do you, how do you make that? What's your decision model? You know, how do you, how do you make that decision? And then it actually can go well beyond that. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of ramifications to decisions. So how do things... How do things really perform, not just in the initial term, but in the long term? What if I said to you I could find a way to improve the useful life of a structure from 30 years to 50 years? 
then, you know, what's that mean to you? Would that change your decision? If I can change performance, societal impacts and all those other things are key to us. When we think of hazards, um, gee, you know, there's a lot of impacts. The obvious ones, like earthquakes, seismic impacts, we've got our shake table. Uh, wind engineering is a strength for us today. Uh, we now have in place a wind tunnel that's brand new that we've just built on campus so we can do wind modeling. We have uh, research collaborations with other, with other um, institutes and centers that do wind engineering. Snow and ice and, and flooding and water impacts and even we were meeting today, interestingly enough, that part of the discussion today, can we design to resist blast, right? We have security issues. Uh, survivability issues. You know, can you design a structure? We've got, you may not know this, no reason why you would, but one of the engineering construction firms in the state of Alabama is the leading embassy <coughs> constructor in the world. So, but, but, you know, if you want to talk to them, which is our purpose this morning, can you design structures to resist blast? Specifically, projectile blast. Spe specifically, ballistic, you know, and they got, I mean, can you do that? Yes, we can. How does it affect weight and cost? Well, that's a, that's a project. I mean, we have to figure that out. We have to do some things, right? So all the hazards is, is broad. Fire is a hazard. Community, and, and, and that's really our focus, is trying to expand beyond a single structure to something that is broader. It's based in the community. Most all of you probably lived in Tuscaloosa when we had the tornado. And, and one of the realities is that as an individual homeowner, individually, I had certain obligations perhaps to insure my home. And, and, and maybe I would say that I tried to mitigate my risk by insuring my home, all right? But in reality, when that tornado came through, it overwhelmed this community. So the, so it, the individual risk mitigations that we undertook as, as independent individual homeowners um, wasn't sufficient to help our community, perhaps, you know, resist or, or survive in that kind of environment. So the community, macro environment, is our focus. This is a lot of fun stuff because we're really at the interface of a lot of things. First of all, we're at the interface of design and construction, and I would add to that planning. I mean, can we, can we plan projects better by, by more, I think, more accurately defining what the needs are? And can we change the way we construct facilities? We're certainly at the interface of public and private sectors. I mean, one of the things we'd like to do is, is find innovations, and the question is how do we move those innovations into the marketplace? One way to do that is to influence policy, to influence building codes, to influence, you know, regulatory bodies that govern all of that, that'd be one way. Maybe there's other ways we can do it. How do you compel private sector to do it? How do I compel or how do I move that process along? Technology, we are in a technology rich environment and, and how we employ the technology so that's beneficial. Uh, technology sometimes has a shorter shelf life. There's, there's things that, you know, technology is, is obviously constantly changing. So how do, we, how do we utilize technology in a very creative, innovative way to our benefit to help us achieve these? What you can't probably see up here, we have, we have environmental impacts, social, economic, and physical. So we're, we're, we're concerned about all those things. The physical, the physical structure, the environmental impact, the social impact, and the economic impact. I mean, we, we want to be, we wanna be um, holistic in our approach here. We do too much research focused on the present state. Uh, we really want to look at life cycle. And when you start looking at life cycle issues, then the whole problem gets more complex and much more interesting. So we want to improve performance over its life. 
and that poses a lot of challenges to us. So I'm just going to move a little quicker through that. I talked about the tornado. That was really a motivator. But the reality is we were motivated before the tornado. And, and the sad reality is there's going to be more tornadoes. Maybe not here, I hope. But there's going to be more. There's going to be more earthquakes. There's going to be more natural hazards. There's going to be a lot of other things that happen. And the, and the real question to folks like us that are sitting in the room is, well, what are we doing? You know? <laughs> what, what, will, will the year 2020 be any different than today? I mean, are we, are we learning anything? And if we are, how are we getting that into the marketplace or how are we influence in society? Just doing this for the sake of doing it is not really appealing. I mean, the whole idea is that there's some ultimate benefit from all of this, and that's what we're trying to do. So, so while that motivated us, there's a lot of other things that motivate others. And, and we, we do travel the globe. And, and when you travel to these other places, I mean, Haiti is still not rebuilt. You know, Nepal's in real trouble. I mean, there's other locations. If we track social vulnerability, San Paulo, Brazil is in real trouble. I mean, and, and someone would say, well, gee, it's just the problem's just too big to solve. Well, true in the sense that we can't just snap our fingers and it's not an immediate kind of answer, but, it, but it's certainly rich with research opportunity. And I, I am optimistic enough to think that there's some things we could do that can improve our physical habitat and make it more resilient and make it more sustainable. So we're trying, to, we're trying to address all that. One of the things we're doing is managing change. I mean, what can you do? One of our collaborators, the Insurance Institute for Business, Home, and Safety, they, they have the capability to actually do full-scale, two-story um, construction. We build two houses side by side, full-scale, and blow wind at them. You know, it's large-scale work. They collaborate with us. And, um, you know, what you can't probably read on there, there's something that says fortified. So what we're doing, trying to, we're trying to test the improved version to the standard version and see if we really have impact. And then how do you get that in the marketplace? In other words, how do you improve best practices? And that's what we're trying to do. So we focus on not only the research, but how to move the research into practice. I'd like to think that we develop some expertise out of the center that we can share with others. One is the focus on environmental stewardship. Um, I'm not politically minded, um, but that's dominating the news this week. Right? I mean, there's some issue about uh, global climate and what's going on with all of that. And what's its impact? Well, environmental stewardship is related to that, and, and, and we need to do that. I tell all of my guys that I work with I tell my students, frankly, in fact, I tell everybody that I interact with that ultimately I think in our profession, in my profession anyway, that if you were to distill it down, uh, our responsibility is to manage uncertainty. I mean, we, we, we really have to find out what's creating the uncertainty and mitigate it. I mean, that's the job. That, that's, what, that's what we're paid to do and what we want to do. And that forces us to be innovators but it also requires us to integrate across the boundaries. And I mean, I've said that a bunch of times already, and I know that, but I want to get it in about a thousand times before I, do, before I conclude here. Well, we've done some research. Um, the one that uh, I'm just going to highlight a couple, then I'm going to quit, and you can ask me any question that you would like. Um, University of Alabama has been effective in uh, pursuing a major NSF proposal. We thought we had this won. Uh, we didn't win it. We thought we had it won, and it cycled back, and we're guardedly optimistic we're going we're gonna to do this. But this is, this, we're going to win this. We, we, this is focused on, on um, response to um, natural hazards. And the collection of data, data as all of you probably are well aware, data itself can be perishable. You know, if you wait too long, the data's gone. So this is all about capturing perishable data, disseminating that so that it's useful to all the folks that are researching and studying natural hazards. Uh, we would propose, and if this all goes through, we would create 
an experimental facility that's focused on capturing post-disaster information. So we would serve as the deployment group. We would be deployed wherever the disaster is. We would have rapid deployment uh, to capture that data. And we thought a lot about how to do this, and um, that's in place. In fact, the research team, this is an active one, um, you'll see a couple of things there. First of all, it's across some organizational boundaries within our own university, but also there's multiple universities and others that collaborate. So many of you are involved with this actually, but uh, quite broad in our approach. And quite broad in the research disciplines, which is appropriate in what we have to do. Uh, so planning, reconnaissance, processing, and making available or reusing data is kind of the scheme of this whole research thrust. So really broad and in response to an NSF in an NSF solicitation. And you see the whole point of this slide just without going into detail is the rapid capture and dissemination of the data. Wind engineering, one of the things that you, you, you might find interesting and, and we're really fortunate. One of the things I like about working at the University of Alabama is, um, is there's a lot of friendly folks here. And, you know, it's a collegial environment, and I really enjoy that. And um, Lars Powell, who runs the uh, insurance side of the house over in the business college, he and I were really focused on wind engineering. And so we are today building um, and I'm going to tell you some things, but I'm going to need John Wiest over here, who he might need to cover his ears a little bit, but, but we're building a slamming debris cannon. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I think when we sold the idea, uh, you know, people, people thought, well, you know, it's like this little thing that shoots little two-by-fours. Well, think more like a battleship. Is, is, is kind of where we're at here. So we have um, here, it's already paid for. Um, it's on its way, it's being fabricated, but we have four articulating cannons that can shoot simultaneously so we can throw uh, both the debris field and the projectiles at once. That is, is going to shoot at a target which itself articulates so that we can get glancing blows and, and things that more uh, model the real world rather than the current test which really don't model very effectively the real world. So we're excited about that and that's an ongoing thing that we're doing right now. Um, we have a lot of wind related research that's been funded. You know this is Andy Grettinger out uh, looking at a safe room. You know the, the issue is not so much can we build one, you know, I could, I, could, I could build a safe room in my house and I feel good about that, but that's not really what, I mean, I, I want to change the community. In fact, I'm sorry, I'd really like to change the world. I really would. And so we're trying to do that, and we're looking at ways that we can not just build safe rooms inside crappy, cr excuse me, I don't, I don't want us to build safe rooms inside um, poor performing facilities. I'd rather just to improve the facilities so we don't have total destruction and loss of life. And, and, and we can do that, right? So we just have to change our thinking a little bit. Um, we, we have a lot of things ongoing. And here's kind of my close. We're, we're at a wonderful spot. And that's um, very exciting for me. We're actually now receiving calls from other universities asking us to collaborate. So rather than us chasing them, We've, we kind of crested where they're chasing us a little bit. And they're only chasing us because we've been able to link with folks like Sieber and CAPS and so many of the others and the insurance guys. And that's exciting. So when I get a call from the University of Illinois or Oklahoma and they, and they want to partner with us, um, that's, that's, really, that's really a kick. And we're, and we're there. And so we're only there because we have a lot of people participating. So please uh, join us. I guess would be my message. There's room for everybody in what we're doing. And we would really, we would really like to be very aggressive um, and partner with everybody in the room at some level because it all influences our built environment. So I want to conclude and say thank you very, very much.
a copy of the presentation if you'd like it. I've already emailed to uh, Laura. So Laura can disseminate it or tell me to disseminate it or however she wants to do that if you want a copy. Uh, and I uh, would welcome any question that you have. question. Yes. Um, at, well, I guess during your research and after you do research and actually collect the data and have recommendations and that kind of thing, how do you, I mean, if your goal is to improve communities, improve community awareness and resilience, how do you plan on getting that information in the hands of people in the community? Because it's dependent on them. It is indeed. Right? And, and I, I don't have a pat answer for that. I mean, mm -hmm. sort of the classic way to do that in my field is to influence building codes. But the reality is we have to do more than just influence building codes. You have to change the way people think. And we have to ch change the way they share information. Mm -hmm. uh, my colleague from the institute over here, he's, he's focused on policy, right? That we need to change public policy. We need, we need, we need to change the way we, we behave and the way we think, and that's not so easy. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't have the answer for Well, I just know that, I mean, after the tornado, so much of the community resilience was due to um, communication, you know, radio stations. I worked at University Mall during that time, and we basically became a hub right. of place for people to go get information. We had, okay. like, the Duracell battery truck there where people could go charge phones if they didn't have power and things like that. And I think that there's just, there's so much technology out there and it's helping create such a huge social network that I think there's got to be a way to you know, push information that way so that people can tell each other instead of relying on academia to tell You, you would say certainly that Tuscaloosa is the wiser for having gone through it. Then why isn't, and, and I'm, not, I'm not making a political no. statement, right? But then, why aren't we then taking those lessons and communicating to other, communica to other communities before the event, right? I mean, we're much better proactive than reactive. So, so distilling those lessons learned down and sharing them where they can be, you know, adopted and, and where they can uh, have influence on other communities is really how to get the message out and how to do that. And we're having those kind of discussions. I mean, I say that kind of pointedly because the city of Tuscaloosa is also uh, working with us because they'd like to do that very thing. I mean, they, they would like to take those lessons learned and communicate that out to others, and, and we need to do that. Um, what, 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 what we're trying to do is get beyond a structural engineer saying, look, I, I, um, I found a better nailing pattern here to, to make this corner on this particular structure um, you know, a stronger connection than it would have, okay, and that's good, and that's part of it, but is that, is that construction technique common to the community, and then if it is, what can we do to make that happen? I mean, how, how can we really influence communities? Yes, sir. You mentioned a couple of times about lead engineering. Yes. Lead engineering is a large cost area. What is that aspect to you thinking? Well, we have some faculty, um, who specialize in wind engineering, but we'll never have um, enough, really, to, to do what we need to. So for us, it means partnering with other institutions and other organizations. So wind engineering uh, is a very robust field. And, and we're engaged in it, and we're doing some things. So we have our own wind tunnel. We have our own debris cannon. We, we just received a fairly large NSF grant to, that's wind engineering focused. Uh, but, but for us to really do what we want to do, it means partnering with these other organizations to, to really influence it. So um, it's its own science, just in a way like seismic engineering is its own size of the science. And so um, to do all the things we'd like to do in the center, we, we really need to collaborate with a lot of others. Does that answer your question a little bit? Yeah, but I was just <coughs> Thinking about what is that aspect of what you Like, say, is it uh, in flow patterns around, around the buildings or um, how it is affecting the collapse of buildings? Yes, yeah. what, what we're doing in, in our case here is we're looking at different um, construction techniques or different ways of constructing wall panels, for example. Um, 
the way you use the wood studs and the um, plywood sheathing or whatever that wall section is, they behave differently under wind, um, under, under wind conditions. And so we replicate all of that in scale models um, and we, we test the performance. And the product of that is that, that uh, we're able to influence uh, the way homes are built or the way structures are built. And we want to get beyond just wood. We want to do other things as well. So um, th that's really the focus. There's some sort of fluid flow structure from directions. Yes. Yes. <coughs> Our, uh, Hard breaking can, can throw a 50 pound projectile 150 miles an hour. I was all cool with that, Gene, <laughs> only with the Gatling gun. <laughs> and I was, I was going to ask you something about the debris can. I'm, my training is in meteorology, and so I've worked with a few meteorologists with engineers doing building damage assessments. So I was wondering, it seems like the enhanced Fujita scale that we have right now is lagging way behind the construction practices, and there's so many different types of structures out there that don't really conform to the established scale we yeah. have right now. Is there a lot of emphasis on trying to somehow? Yeah, the way that works is um, you can have a persuasive um, body of research that actually ultimately is reflected in the building code. So far, so good. That's, prob that, that's enough of a challenge to get that to happen. But the reality is, unless this community adopts that code into its enforcement, right, as a, as a, as a regulation in our community, if we're, if we're not going to adopt and enforce that building code, it has no effect. So part of the challenge is, is getting communities to adopt uh, as part of their policy, as part of their regulatory policy, that, that, that these codes will be applied. And frankly, in a lot of the United States, that's just not happened. I mean, we're, we're you know, the, the building code that's in force is way behind. Um, and building codes are constantly updated, and the reality is the municipalities are way behind. But even if the municipality adopted that code, it doesn't necessarily mean that the county did, right? or that this county might be different from that county, or this city is different than that city. And that's the reality behind it. But to build on that, do you then try to attack it from other angles, like say, the office is a mass producer of homes? Absolutely. Do you try to get them to go above and beyond the local code? Um, is manufacturing you would, you know, you always hear about it? Like absolutely. You, you would, you would uh, we try to influence like our habitat, right? So we would try to get Horton, for instance, to say they're building fortified homes that have the, you know, that has this improved resiliency. And they, they're able to market that and to demonstrate that with data. And so that's one way. But we really need, it, you know, it's a big educational outreach component to all of this. All of the big research proposals and all of you have participated in those, there's a there's a portion of that that says, well, how would you disseminate? And how do you educate? And how do you, you know, what's, how does this fold into the, well, for us and for what we're trying to do, that's a huge big deal. I mean, addressing it in the lab is not going to cut it. I mean, we can, we can do that, and that's, that's what we need to do, but we, we need to really be thoughtful about how we change the societies in which we live. The research that was done with the NSF RAP that, that Andrew registered in, actually was, the results of that was used to change the building codes in Oklahoma and Warren and Reno as a result of the work that they did. And that was a very hard and arduous process that you can get those building codes changed. Mm -hmm. Sure. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes? It's more of a side remark to the scenario that you mentioned about the reach of people and approach to God. It's already the existence of the communication technology. Right. Right. It's putting in application things we already have, right? So it's that's that innovation and integration piece uh, that we want to do. By the way, I'm trying to patent that, so keep that to yourself. <laughs> Ed, there are many policy analysts that believe that uh, the concept of sustainability or sustainable development, as the UN called it, 
many years ago. It was a concept at odds with itself. How do you feel about that in the modern yeah. world? And uh, what are the implications for the developing world? You know, it's a, it's a great point. There's sustainability is um, perhaps this generation's greatest buzzword, right? And in fact, some engineering programs all around the United States just jumped on the wagon and renamed themselves. You know, there's the school of sustainable whatever. And, and um, there's a bit of a backlash from some of that because sustainability um, doesn't necessarily have a commonly accepted definition. Um, it's interpreted differently. There's, there's a lot of permutations. And so as a result of that and an inability to probably quantify benefit and to do the kinds of things, then it kind of falls into disfavor and, and it's, it, it, it's, it's so vague it, we lose it sometimes. Um, so I acknowledge that and, w and we acknowledge all of that. Nonetheless, uh, whatever word you use to describe the issue or the problem, the problem is real. The challenge is real, the need is real, and so we, we really need to be focused on it. And new buzzwords come along. Resiliency is kind of the newest, the newest one, or the latest one, perhaps. And there'll be another one. But, you know, that's okay. Um, so I've kind of been through it. I equated a little bit, I'm out of time, but I kind of uh, 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 equated a little bit to quality. Quality goes through that same thing. You know, I remember when everything was total quality management. Mm -hmm. And then it became, you know, re-engineering, and <clears throat> and then it, you know, then it was uh, Six Sigma, and then it was Lean, and then it was whatever. You know, it just keeps it keeps saying. Well, you know, whether it's sustainability today and resiliency tomorrow, but we're still going we're still going to go after it, right? So that's what we're all about. I'm out of time. Thank you for um, allowing me to speak to you.